Well, it's all about democracy. I mean, I think uh, the general impression that democracy is in retreat globally. Uh, we might, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, these spikes like the uh, Malaysian election remind you that it is perhaps not really in retreat. And uh, we, we might be overestimating the fact that uh, the democracy is in retreat. But there is, of course, a globally kind of a thing of a movement or, shall we say, a kind of a gravitating towards uh, uh, leaders, democratic leaders or, or leaders of democracy who seem to be more authoritarian, more uh, kind of uh, individualistic and things like that. But these things happen. I don't think you can, uh, you can really uh, sign the death warrant of democracy uh, so quickly. And I think Malaysian case uh, really shows us as to how democracy can uh, make a comeback, provided the circumstances are appropriate. And in this case, for example, but in, in Southeast Asia, which is the broad canvas on which uh, we will be talking, UMNO, for example, which is ruled, um, of course, later on in the coalition called the Barisan National, since Malaysia's independence, and you know, this is the, this has been the trend. Well, this um, the election, of course, also shows well, um, certainly a victory for democracy, and there are many reasons which our panelists uh, will, who I will introduce in a moment, uh, will discuss. Uh, but it also shows that that an old authoritarian leader is back in power, uh, but through, but through democracy. So you know you have this uh, uh, this you know peculiar kind of situation where um, and then Anwar uh, the guy in jail is back uh, you know having been pardoned and things like that. So there are other elections going to take place in Cambodia, which is of course nothing to write home about, where it, the election will be without an opposition, without you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, Thailand because I have been ambassador there and wrote a few pieces recently on the democracy deficit in Thailand and uh, so I wrote, I began my article by saying that democracy in Thailand has suffered by a thousand cuts. Now Thailand is very unique in that sense. It has, it has gravitated between democracy and military rule and uh, because of its unique circumstances, you know, the monarchy, the military and the business elite. I think these are the three people who really combine to sort of undermine democracy in Thailand. But uh, Thailand has three political parties, the Army, Navy and the Air Force. And, uh, and they in turn used to, <laughs> and they in turn used to sort of you know, shove each other aside, some general or air marshal or whatever. And that's how they have uh, managed. <clears throat> but I think one moot point about all this is that why has democracy not taken deep roots in these countries. I think one thing is of course the nature of the people, the other is the economic uh, factor. I think today, the Malaysian elections today I think uh, uh, shows up I think two things, perhaps a slowing down of the economy and the corruption levels that have dogged the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister Najib. And people are even today I think they've dredged up some uh, you know, from his house and properties and all, another $250 million. Can you imagine these figures? One, one Prime Minister accumulating this kind of uh, money in, uh, in, a, in a country. Uh, oh, Malaysia is a middle income country, almost $10,000 per, per, per capita nowadays, and doing well economically, I would say. But still, I think, I mean, even the economic factor, which perhaps led many people in this area, to accept a certain kind of authoritarian democracy or democratic or authoritarian leaders, today is not enough to the, the economic money in your pocket is not enough uh, to so people are changing in some ways that they want to see or they at least want to throw out the guy who's in power, which uh, is is of course very democratic if you go through the ballot box. So I think this uh, Malaysian elections have been a landmark, and uh, except for I think Indonesia, where democracy I, be, I I would dare to suggest has taken deeper roots, uh, there is uh, there is not much that one can talk about in terms of 
democratic uh, uh, traditions and democratic uh, sort of behavior in these kind of in these countries. Now let us see. Indonesia is also going to have local elections. What happens then? And uh, Mahathir has said that uh, uh, that the uh, Malaysian elections have been the dirtiest elections uh, so far in Malaysia. Now what he means by that, you know, I think all of you know. And uh, but the the question now is: Is Malaysia bucking the trend? Professor Baratas Koshal. Secretary General, Society for Indian Ocean Studies, and former Professor Sayas Jainu, a very well-known expert on, in this area. Uh, next would be uh, Dr. Qureshi, also a very well-known figure, one of our uh, civil service colleagues and uh, former election commissioner and advisor, international idea. Then Professor Shankari Sundar Raman, Sundara Raman, sorry, Sundara Raman. Uh, Center for Indo-Pacific Studies. Even JNU is catching up. They are called it Indo-Pacific Studies, SIS. So uh, next would be uh, closing, you know, kind of wrapping up would be, and his address would be Niranjan, our Dr. Niranjan Sahu, uh, who's senior fellow, one of my colleagues. And then we'll have a Q&A session and we'll have something. I would venture to make some closing remarks uh, as to where we have reached after the discussion, and then uh, you are all invited for high tea. So that's the that's the program for today. And with that, I offer the floor to Professor Baradas Ghoshal. Uh, I think you have about um, well, it says 15 minutes, but I'll cut it a bit. I think you want to cut it further. Yes, yeah, okay. because we began late. So I am a bit stickler for time. And uh, so, let's say 12 to 14 minutes. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think since that time is short, sometimes I'll go telegraphic yes. in my expressions. Now, the first thing that I want to present on Malaysia that is sometimes called a tsunami, a political tsunami taking into consideration the dynamics of Malaysian politics. But I would suggest that is not something which was not expected. The winds of change were actually blowing for quite some time, starting from 2008 elections. For the first time, the ruling coalition, which is Barisan National, lost its two-thirds majority. And that is what is needed for amending the constitution. So the magic figure was lost all of a sudden. And certain trends emerged, some kind of split in various factional and in various coalition groups. And the Barisan National consisted of actually three race-based political groups. The Malay group represented by AMNO, the Chinese MCA, Malaysian Chinese Association and the Malaysian Indian Association, Indian Congress. So it was a race based politics. Now, and this was going on for a long period of time. Then what we see in 2013 election that it not only lost a two thirds majority, it got its majority all right, was able to get into power, but it lost about five states in terms of, I mean, inside states within Malaysian Federation. And then, of course, the final blow was sort of came in 2018. Now, interestingly, everybody talks about the winning coalition led by Mahathir and, of course, the lost one by BN. But there was a third formation, which people ignored, actually, which was led by an Islamic political party, which talks about in introducing Sharia and you know Hudud law and various other things in the sort of in the in the governing sort of system. So that cannot be actually ignored. Although people have been talking about two trajectory of two coalitions, that is one led by Bahati, that is Pakatan Harapan, and the other one is Barisan National. But the third formation, Gagasan Sajatra, that also has to be taken into consideration and that was led by this radical Islamic political party. 
So that is another interesting aspect. And if you have to really uh, look into the pattern of votes in different parts, that also shows certain interesting trade and development. It was a kind of a west-east divide. In the west coast of the peninsula, the ruling quasi, I mean the winning coalition got their majority votes, and in the eastern coast, it was the BN. But at the same time, in the east coast and the west coast, in both the places, the parts which was most significant, both in the urban and the rural areas, the dominant population in Malaysia. Malays were uncertain about the possible impact of any political change and they didn't want to really rock their votes because they thought if there is any political change it might lead to the loss of their what they call Katuanan Malayu, the special privileges and the rights of the Malays. And that was the thing which was actually holding that political change in Malaysia. But this time things were quite different because other important factors came into the political dynamics and that was, you know, the rising cost of living of the people. Chinese investment in certain areas and which was high in kind of investment that automatically led to the inflation within the country and the increase in the cost of living and the younger generation and, and the corruption and the younger generation who are below and actually 44% of the total electorate are actually below 35. And this younger generation of people, although they have also been brought up under the special privileges of Malay rights and all that kind of thing, but still they're much more exposed to the international media as well as they're less tolerant about graft, corruption and impunity and all that kind of thing. So suddenly you see the younger generation suddenly felt that it needs to be changed. And this change actually came about essentially because of the split within the Malay votes. I'm emphasizing this point, but this cannot be taken for granted. This might also can revert if the circumstances change. So that this particular point also needs to be taken into consideration. Then I think the most important factor that really also brought about a change also is the role of two major personalities within Malaysian politics. One is Mahathir Mohamad, the former Prime Minister, an autocrat, no doubt, in his own way, but he also contributed to the economic growth of Malaysia and is known as the father of Malaysian modernization. So despite the fact that the opposition tried to, you know, sort of uh, tried to undermine his personality by talking all kinds of things about his past role, yet the younger generation, again the 35 below 35, they didn't know what actually happened during Mahathir time because they were either young children like two, three years old, so they didn't have any knowledge. But the interesting fact is that in the Malaysian school books, you know, curriculum, Mahathir's autobiography is a text. And obviously the autobiography talks about his major role in bringing about the kind of change that came about. So it actually acted as a boomerang. The opposition tried to undermine him. But the very fact of the you know, dynamics of politics actually catapulted him into another kind of a sort of you know, a leadership role. And that actually led to the, this sudden sort of uh, reversal of things. Then I think the important point also has to be taken into consideration about the role of Anwar Ibrahim, who is the deputy of Mahathir at one time. He was the one who put him to jail and brought Sodomi charges and all kinds of other things. But the politics changed in Malaysia and suddenly Mahathir was willing to address Anwar Ibrahim. And even though he was in jail on different kinds of charges and even Najib, the ex-Prime Minister, he brought sort of charges against him and sent him back to jail again. But despite all that, from the jail itself, his charisma played an important role in sustaining the kind of opposition movement and the kind of language his political party, uh, Partai Kiyadil and Rayat, which is uh, People's Justice Party, if you translate it in uh, English, People's Justice Party, it talks about social justice, talked about you know, social reform in terms of some of the sort of you know, 
inequalities that exist within the Malaysian society. So that also played an important role in terms of this political change. The chairman of the Malaysian Chinese Association was actually defeated in a Chinese constituency is an indication of this particular fact that people are not really buying that race-based politics anymore. That's another trend. And the second would be is the you know the trajectory, what you can call it, the two coalition kind of a thing. Now I talked about third force. One is the Pakatan Horapan, the winning coalition, and the BN Barisan National. And the third force I talked about Bahas. But what will happen in course of time that since AMNO, that is the party of the Malays, and the PAS, both actually derive the support from the Malay population. Progressive tapes, what they call, you know, what is called the path dependency kind of analysis in electoral politics. It's that, you know, progressive tapes along the way on a path that is the path of reform, or what in Malaysia is called reformacy, you know, uh, along the path, valorized by institutional, ideological, and programmatic developments will lead to increasing returns in the coming elections. Now, the reformacy agenda that the Pakatan Harapan actually presented to the people <laughs> represented a part, and that is why I'm talking about a part, and the progressive sort of, you know, development in that part will lead to emergence of a kind of a consolidated democracy in the, you know, words of Huntington. But that if the trend has to consolidate, democratic trend has to consolidate, then I think there has to be also a change within the BN, that is the opposition now, the coalition politics, they will also have to create a kind of a situation where they can also come back and regain power. That means there will be some kind of churning within BN and some kind of coalition that might emerge. So, I would say in political science jargon, Malaysia has achieved the crucial step, crucial step of a turnover electoral system a turnover electoral system which might lead to consolidation of democracy. But for the democracy to consolidate, Pakatan Harapan will have to win another election. Because the five years is not enough to bring about the kind of reforms and the reformers that they've been talking about. So if there is another election that might lead to the consolidation of democracy in Malaysia. But these are only trends towards that direction. Much will depend how the bargaining takes place within the coalition that has taken power, Pakatan Harapan. Interestingly, although Mahathir is the Prime Minister, he is 93 next month, going to be 93. And although he looks quite strong, and people say that he might survive beyond 100. Uh, and it looks, although frail, but doesn't look his age. So, and he's a man who is unpredictable. And there is a possibility that he might take over, in, I mean, take over as the Prime Minister in about another year or two, because there are certain other legal uh, things that need to be cleared before he can become the Prime Minister. But the kind of, you know, reforms and the promises that they have made like, for example, removal of GST, removal of, I mean, bringing about subsidies, which the earlier government had sort of done away with. All that would be quite a difficult task in times of a situation where there is a lot of competitiveness and the economy is not showing any major sort of you know, turnover at the moment. So that could also bring about certain uncertainties in the political situation, and that might also change the whole sort of, you know, debate about this reformers. And the Malays also again, are again an uncertain element. They might again sort of emerge back. And, you know, 
The word Ranamak, Amok, is a Malay word. It has originated in Malay Indonesian expression. You never know when they get sort of mad, what they call gila. Gila is mad. Uh, so it might again turn back. Just one more sentence. I think I mean, change of government will also bring about certain changes in the foreign policy of the country. Najib was bankrolled by China because of the, you know, the scandal and all that. And Mahathir being a highly nationalistic person, he has already questioned some of the deals that Malaysia has done with the Chinese. For example, those, you know, leasing of a, an island in Johor Bahru, where the Chinese are constructing high-end kind of buildings and condominiums, which the Malays can't afford. So the Chinese are buying that. So he has also warned about, you know, China set, Chinese settling down within Malaysia that might upset the entire demographic character in Johor Bahru. So all that will have some impact on that. And the last point that I'll make about, you know, people have been quite hopeful about, I mean, people have been talking about change in Cambodia. But one warning that I might say, I mean, Hun Sen is a, an autocrat. He has <coughs> centralized power. He has a lot of other things. But the opposition is no angel. They have no proven record. And the opposition has already actually initiated within the Facebook and other things a, a campaign against, you know, Viet Cambodians, the minority. And within the Cambodian psyche, the Khmer psyche, there is always that fear about the Cambodia, about the Vietnamese, you know, invading the country and trying to colonize the sort of, uh, colonize the Khmer people. Now, they have initiated a kind of an anti-Vietnamese rhetoric within the election campaign. And even if the opposition wins, it's going to be quite unstable politics and it might lead to a lot of violence. And if violence takes place in Cambodia, is the Chinese who are going to take advantage of that. And that will also further entrench the Chinese position within Cambodia, affecting the unity of ASEAN and the geopolitics of indo -Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Very important points, which I shall not go into now, but maybe later, as we go along. Now, uh, Dr. Kuleshi, your over to I was asked to confine myself to uh, Myanmar and uh, Malaysia. Uh, I had uh, started doing a study of uh, South Asia, South and Southeast Asia, uh, democracy and challenges and the future about a couple of years ago as a fellow at uh, King's College London. But then I found, and I was studying 16 countries, then uh, I found that that uh, canvas became too large and then I restricted myself to only the SAR country which is a study which is uh, under program. But my initial work on uh, all 16 countries, uh, some of the remnants are still with me. Uh, Ambassador Chakravarti hinted at that whether the, uh, this region is receiving the due attention of the world community because consolidation of democracy and its performance becomes uh, vested interest for the, the entire democratic world, uh, which unfortunately seems to be missing. There are lots of international organizations and uh, bilateral uh, uh, arrangements um, in different countries, but there is no organized uh, uh, effort to ensure that the uh, democracy functions right. I happen to be an uh, observer in the Myanmar election, which was, uh, in, in a way, I felt very proud that I'm part of history because the uh, election was taking place in 50 years. And uh, in uh, I have the rule, and I was very impressed <coughs> with the quality. The, the way election commission behaved very independently and the, the kind of election that um, was conducted uh, was uh, really uh, remarkable. 
the region as you know was uh, has been uh, militancy prone and its geographical importance is very important because close to two of the biggest powers in the world india and china so geopolitically this is a very important region and india therefore has a, a lot of stake and a lot of interest in it not that elections were not held in the military rule in those 50 years but uh, obviously uh, the, uh, all those elections were uh, had a history of electoral fraud where eligible voters were often pre prevented from casting votes freely. There was manipulation of results, the, uh, the <coughs> altering of the composition of the electorate uh, was very common. Now, one word uh, I have in my entire career, uh, even in the election commission, I have missed in India is gerrymandering. Now, the way they draw, redraw boundaries to, so, to suit their end and to at the cost of their rivals. Russia. 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 It's a classic example. Every, every other country has that, India doesn't, which is something we can be very proud of. We never talk, we never hear such a thing. And, and so much so that lots of people would not have, been, have even heard this term gerrymandering. But they constituted three of 29 MPs. And two out of 35 members of Rakhine, uh, Rakhine or Rakhine, 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 Rakhine uh, Regional Assembly. Then the anti-Muslim uh, diet surfaced after reform was started in 2011. And uh, there are about uh, 2,200 Rohingyas were killed and 1,40,000 were displaced. A problem which has uh, refused to die down. In fact, it has even uh, got worse uh, over the years. Now, nearly a million ethnic Rohingyas have been debarred from voting in the, uh, the election uh, which I had attended um, and something which is, uh, is going on. At that time, uh, Secretary General of UN, uh, Man Ki Moon, had commented uh, the strong words, uh, I am deeply disappointed by this effective disenfranchisement of the Rohingyas and other minority communities. Barring incumbent Rohingya parliamentarian, incumbent Rohingya parliamentarian from standing for re-election is particularly egregious. Now, the Aung San Suu Kyi's role also has been very, very interesting. In fact, uh, this is I'm now uh, reading from an article which I wrote in Indian Express. Uh, with their permission, I wrote this article where I had uh, commented on Aung San Suu Kyi. When she, in an interview to Garan Thapar, she had said she saw worrying signs of religious intolerance, and uh, which was uh, very perfunctory tokenism, according to me. But her deferring silence throughout the, the whole uh, process of election, at that time I wanted to give her a long rope, and uh, I thought that she's just being uh, 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 politically uh, pragmatic, as in India we know that political electoral uh, constraint requires that you keep quiet, don't talk of Muslim, don't say a word of sympathy, otherwise you lose your Buddhist vote. But it turned out that she was uh, not what she uh, claimed to be. It, it's a pity that she was uh, called Asian uh, Mandela. She was equated by Mahatma Gandhi <coughs> and she turned out to be the, uh, a very, the, I must say, third-rate politician. Uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, behavior she has seen through the election process and even thereafter, very, very weak. If a leader of her, uh, uh, of his stature, could not handle this problem, who else can? can, can? Uh, maybe the, that is what she is. Elected, uh, the election is going to be well. Um, uh, 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 there is uh, uh, nothing uh, uh, more to uh, add to all this except that uh, after the election, there have been some by-elections. There were 19 uh, by-elections in January, in January 2017 and usual issues of management of election, that there was overcrowding of the booth, lack of coordination, uh, lack of standard operating procedures, so, and there were um, uh, scope for enhanced security. Our, uh, the EU has a recommended and our recommendation is there should be more of a civic engagement. On the Malaysian thing, a lot has already been said, but uh, I only have some random uh, points to add. That uh, so this election shows that after 61 years of uh, uninterrupted rule by a single coalition, which is the largest in the world, longest. Uh, uh, ruling coalition in the world which ended. And interestingly, the Ambassador Chakrabarti used the word uh, retreat of democracy.
was he and Rizal, um, um, and uh, he mentioned that how an old authoritarian uh, leader is back in power. You know, interestingly, the uh, this uh, ruling coalition of 61 years has been defeated by whom the opposition, which actually had started in opposition to the Mahathir Mohammad Ali against his dictatorship. See, now he is leading the movement against his own dictatorship. <laughs> and he has won. So now this, this is the irony of, of it. And obviously, he'll have, we'll see very interesting development that lots of things which he had done because he's a very, very bright and dynamic person. He deserved to be uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, but uh, Mahathir has now regretted. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim seems to be in, in, in the mood to forgive it again. He uh, supported uh, 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 Mahathir. And they are now uh, uh, working uh, closely together. Now, in 2017, the uh, Malaysia the corruption perception is very, very high. Uh, it was number 62 in, uh, according to Transparency Factor. In, and they found very various faults in the recently conducted election. Uh, some of which were, of course, have been already referred to in uh, various ways. Uh, one was, of course, unconstitutional redrawing of the boundaries, the gerrymandering that we have discussed, and Bursi has commented on it. Then, unclean electoral rolls. Uh, we use the word bogus voters, they use the word phantom voters, so it's the same thing. So, uh, lots of bogus voters uh, were, were found. Then, arbitrary disqualification and prevention and manipul uh, uh, and, uh, of the nomination of the candidates. They were prevented from standing for election, thoughts were uh, becoming a kind of a thorn in the flesh for the U.S. And that is when they decided to pull the Razan uh, because uh, this was in the third world country which was uh, developing very fast on very modern lines which was not acceptable to uh, the, the U.S. Um, but anyway, it will be interesting to watch the developments in the one year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joachim. Thank you very much. Very useful insights. Okay, let's proceed further, and uh, we have now have Professor Shankari Sundara Raman. Uh, Thank your, you very much. Your yours. Thank you very much, sir. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And at the outset, Niranjan, thanks for asking me to be part of this discussion. And um, let me just say that I think having heard both Professor Goshal as well as uh, Dr. Qureshi, I think what I would like to do is to sort of Niranjan had also requested that I flag a few points in terms of the regional experiences with democracy as to see how Southeast Asia as a region has been sort of dealing with the entire transition phase in, in various countries as well as whether there has been a consolidation of democracy in some countries or not. And, um, and then he also requested that I take two specific cases, both which are my research areas, that is both Indonesia as well as Cambodia. East Asia per se has been one of the early entrants into the democratic transition phase. It's not a late entrant into it. So in that sense, if you take the first example of what happened in the Philippines in as early as 1986, when I, I mean 30 years hence, what you see is that um, when a country has actually been entrenched in a military or an authoritarian system for several years, the shift doesn't occur in terms of, you see both the contradictions in terms of the complexity of the uh, democratic process and at the same time you see evidence of the democratic shift happening simultaneously. So in that sense, to my mind, if I look at it regionally, there is in sense a kind of a contradiction that exists that on the one hand you have the complex democratic processes shaping up and at the same time you have rich examples of where they have actually worked. So um, in that sense, for my from my understanding, the first thing that I saw was the shift in Philippines. And the Philippine shift is very critical because I, ha I was very fortunate to have lived in the country when the uh, People's Power Revolution took place because my parents lived there and I used to visit the country regularly as a student. And during the People's Power Revolution, the lasting image that comes is that in a democratic transition, it also brings up issues of nationalism, it also brings up issues of minority rights within the state, it also brings up issues of other cleavages that are there within the state structure and this was very evident within the context of all of the Southeast Asian countries. Um, if you look at the roots of, if I have to actually go back and look at the roots of democracy in Southeast Asia, 
I would probably say that the two countries that are good examples of democratic roots in Southeast Asia were both Thailand and the Philippines. Because the Philippines, as far as um, their colonial rule ended, it ended with the battle against the Spanish, majorly with the Spanish. While the, the American rule was there for about 48 years, but the American rule did not was not as uh, you know as vehemently opposed as the Spanish rule. And this is where, and the Americans also started by the early 1900s, they had started reforms within the Philippines and the Philippines parliament towards democratic transitions. The reforms had actually started under an absolute monarchy. So these kind of roots, if one has to trace the roots of democracy in these countries, I would say that the democratic roots in Southeast Asia were not, were not non-evident. They were already there in the sense that even in Indonesia, under the uh, first president, Sukarno, so you will see that several of these countries, even in Cambodia, for example, under uh, King Norodom Sihano, right after the 1946 uh, shift, you see that many of these areas had already started moving towards the democratic options. Um, but they did not sustain. They did not sustain for various reasons. And I'll not go into the details on why, but let me sort of look at um, you know, the aftermath of what has happened in a few of these countries. So to my mind, these are examples of the fact that democratic roots were already there within the region and that it was a question of whether these could be consolidated or not in the post-colonial order when the statehood came to these regions. If anything hit Indonesia the hardest, the country that was hardest hit by the Asian financial crisis, it was Indonesia. I remember the rupee plummeting, the ru Indonesian rupee actually plummeting to its all-time low. You, and the actual, um, what you call, violent protests on the street actually started emerging. It was interesting because until food security hit the Indonesian you know, uh, population, you did not see the protests on the road in spite of the economic uh, financial crisis and the impact that it had on the Indonesian economy. Similar to what we have in India, which is the public distribution system, the Indonesia has, Indonesians have what is called the bulog. And the Bulog is the public distribution system that used to be that catered to, um, you know, for access to food, especially for poorer communities. It is when the Bulog closed down and there was no, there was severe food shortages that you actually saw the riots started being led by the students, and then subsequently mass populations started, you know, joining the riots, and then you see the final that that entire image in one's head of Suharto agreeing to step down from power. The sounding impact in terms of both how uh, the internal uh, details were handled as well as the external. Um, in terms of touching just upon all the countries of the region, let, I think um, uh, Mr. Qureshi actually spoke very uh, in detail about the role that was of Myanmar, what Myanmar is going through. But I think one or two points which I think are very essential when we look at Myanmar is the question of how Myanmar has actually mirrored Indonesia in several ways, you know. So both in terms of the Indonesian army believed for itself a role called the Dwifangsi or the dual function, which was also um, replicated by the uh, Myanmarese uh, military. And this was, <coughs> excuse me, this is a role both in terms of preservation of the territorial integrity of the state, as well as a role in the administrative, political administration of the state. So this is where Dwifangsi and then subsequently Golka here in the context of Myanmar, the Tatmado, both of these decided that they have an entrenched role in the political you know, uh, future of their, or their, their individual states. The Myanmar's reform process, which we've seen in effect from, say, 2011 onwards, I think is probably, I would say it's not really a full shift to democracy, but I think it's still an arrangement which you could call a power-sharing arrangement between a democratically elected government and the military that has been there for the last 70 years. So, because if you have to really look at what are the indicators of kind of democratic shifts, I think if you see two or three of the constitutional provisions in Myanmar, particularly the <coughs> Article 59F, which debars Aung San Suu Kyi from being the president because of being married to a foreigner, and the second article, which is even more, I think, an entrenchment of the military, is Article 436. Because Article 436 clearly identifies a 25% allocation of seats in the parliament for the military. Now, when you have it, and the interesting thing is, any constitutional amendment has to have more than 75% vote in order for a constitution to be amended, any provisions to be amended. So if the entire military votes as a one single block, 
you are not going to get any constitutional amendments passed within the uh, parliament. So I think this is where we have to be very critical that while we see a reform process having come into Myanmar, it's still not a reform process where you can say that there is either institutionalization or consolidation of a democratic process. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, I think you've touched a lot on the Rohingya matter, but I think the one of the most, for me, the compelling um, problems in the Myanmar case in terms of an indicator has also been to see how the press has been managed. Initially, you had nearly, after the 2010 elections and the 11 uh, reform phase, you had nearly 300 newspapers operating. Systematically, the numbers have come down. The media has been, you know, assaulted in various areas. And there is also certain draconian rules, particularly on the Rakhine province and the violence in the Rakhine province. No media has been allowed access to the Rakhine area in terms of being able to look at what are the problems there. One is called upgradation and the other is, um, there's one more, uh, pragmatism. Yeah, so these two words, you know, if you look at the Singaporean uh, politics, everywhere, and it's not, it's systematically you'll see this in 70 years of their history that they talk about upgradation, they talk about pragmatism. So their policies will keep evolving according to the public sentiment and I think that's been one of the areas where and of course, in terms of, if you look at the, you know, the size of the state or whatever it is, the, you know, the ability to be able to deliver has been easier in the context of Singapore. Um, Brunei remains a complete, absolute monarchy with no signs of shift and no elections taking place. The, uh, to my mind, there are two very important aspects which we need to consider in the case of Indonesia. One, if you look at the special autonomy laws that have come in. The special autonomy laws have been enacted for certain areas, especially those areas that were conflicting, that is, uh, say, the provinces like, say, Aceh and Papua, which conflicted with the center. So in order to address this, there have been certain laws pa passed by the Indonesian parliament. I think the critical one, in that sense, is the law enacted in 2006, which is the, uh, what is called the law on government of Aceh. For the first time at the provincial level, the Indonesian uh, state allowed for a government to be formed, like Abdul Rahman Bahir, who was the president in 1999. And uh, you'll see that some amount of the old legacy of that liberal Islamic value is still there. So I think it's going to be very interesting to watch how Indonesia sort of uh, shifts between this, this liberal space and the contestation for a more you know, uh, rigid or a more uh, conservative space. Um, finally, lastly, let me speak a little bit about uh, Cambodia. Um, uh, Cambodia has actually gone through a very interesting phase that, you know, the international powers that were responsible for violating the neutrality of the country throughout the Vietnam War and the subsequent Third Indochina conflict, the 1998 elections, I think, 97 is when Hun Sen over, see, Hun Sen actually lost. If you take any one single person in Southeast Asia other than Suharto, Hun Sen has been the longest reigning uh, premier. He's been there from 1985 onwards. And it's interesting that from 1985 till now, he has been in power. And when the 93 elections took place, it was not Hun Sen's party, that is the, you know, the CPP that won, Cambodian People's Party. It was actually the Hun Sen Pek, which is the royalist party that won the elections. So at the end of that election, Prince Ranarid was the one, Narodom Ranarid was the one who was to become the prime minister, but instead, because Hun Sen threatened that there would be a civil war, it, because the military was under Hun Sen still. So it ended up that they made a power sharing arrangement where six months Hun Sen would be prime minister and six months Ranarid would be prime minister. Subsequently, by 97, you see that the entire Hun Sen had a coup in which he completely threw out the, uh, the royalist party. And it's interesting today that two of the main opposition parties, that is under both Oh, uh, Mr. Ra Sam Rinse, who was Hun Sen's economic minister, finance minister, as well as uh, Kem Sokha. Both of them have joined. These are the two main opposition parties, and they both joined together to form what is called the Cambodia National Rescue Party. Now, in September last year, 2017, the National Rescue Party has actually been disbanded, saying on account of treason, because they're saying that they were conniving with the United States to topple the government the opposition parties have been completely disbanded. So next month's election in Cambodia, there is zero opposition, almost. So there is the, the effort by Sam Rinze, who is now in exile, to, you know, to sort of bring together a small party in terms of a movement. He's not even calling it a political party. He's calling it the Cambodia National Rescue Movement, has also not been addressed because the military power is again with Hun Sen. 
So the other thing I wanted to point out is, uh, sir, you mentioned on the uh, Vietnamese, uh, the Khmer Vietnamese uh, you know, role. I think the emphasis to sort of focus on this Vietnamese identity is also coming from a place because Hun Sen himself is associated with that Vietnamese elite, as the remnants of the Vietnamese elite, you know. So when the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, which were the Khmer Rouge trials, were happening throughout the, you know, say from 2008 or 9 onward, you see that Hun Sen systematically resisted any form of punishment to any members of the Khmer Rouge. Hun Sen himself is part of the erstwhile Khmer Rouge and then moved to a breakaway faction, which was supported by the Vietnamese and they came back to Cambodia and, you know, took power of the state. So this is interesting, so that the entire focus on the Khmer Rouge and the linkages with Vietnam is again coming from the opposition because they see Hun Sen as being part of that entrenched leadership from the earlier era. In Pakistan, the army, the way it sees its role as defender of the state, defender of the ideology, drawing from the Turkish model, which was of course different, defender of the secular state, which is now defunct now under Erdogan, that's gone. Uh, and uh, after the coup and things like that. So, but here also, for example, the Southeast Asia, they, who mentioned a few things about uh, how the army wants a role in the, in the, uh, which is uh, kind of undemocratic in the sense that uh, what we understand uh, the army's role in the, uh, in politics, you know, in, in the state. Anyway, that's one thought that I occurred to me. So, uh, Niranjan, having said this. I would say this narrative of uh, Southeast Asia has to be seen from the point of view of uh, East Asia experience because uh, democracy here, you know, with, uh, it has a long you know, history as, as you rightly said uh, and even monarchies have also supported democracy. So it's a very unique region but then if you look at uh, the region, the region's actually narrative has been inspired by large you know, modernization and economic development and largely from the East, East Asian success story. I am not saying this has been uh, reported by most of the leading democratic uh, uh, think tanks like Freedom House or uh, uh, Economist uh, Democracy Index. So they rank uh, this region as a sort of a flawed, a partially free region. And, and interesting thing is that you know all, all the countries are actually coming under uh, their you know, partially free. But East Timor, East Timor, you know, this uh, latest report by the Freedom House has been given free. So that's a very interesting eh? Probably Malaysia might be a competitor uh, soon if, if things go really well. But I'm saying, so this is an interesting story. You have, uh, you know, such powerful stories like Singapore, but they, they, they remain actually a democratic and achiever and very reluctant to open up the political space. So, so this is a region which is uh, full of uh, surprises. And uh, all kind of you know experimentation has been done. Uh, the second thing about this region is uh, uh, the narrative, uh, democratic narrative in the region has been curbed, as, as I said, through economic performance, largely bringing up you know economic uh, better uh, living standard. And, uh, and and this is sort of I would say there is a sort of direct approval of the society. Larger society approves the rule of strong men or authoritarian, you know, sort of uh, uh, regimes that would actually s deliver sustained economic growth and better standard of living. You can look at, you can almost look at every, each and every country, starting with uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, you look at Thailand, you look at uh, uh, Indonesia, you, you name any, any country for that matter. The reason is that, you know, this, uh, why election happens at a regularity and, you know, a lot of uh, regimes also change uh, without uh, blood said. Overall, if you look at institutions are very fragile and weak. Malaysia put up a very big, huge surprise, you know, the, there was a lot of uh, speculation that, you know, uh, Malaysia Election Commission and all this uh, are part of the same regime and they, would, uh, they were you know, trying their best to ensure that, you know, the uh, ruling party wins. And that has been the trend for a long time. But, uh, but here, there are institutions like monarchy and few other things put up a surprise. In fact, they uh, really took a side with, with the opposition. And there, of course, you have role of market or other things. But I'm saying, overall, if you look at institutions are very weak, including Supreme Court uh, or the judiciary, 
uh, you have electoral commissions in Singapore. It's a classic case is Singapore. It's such a uh, powerful economic example. But if you look at it in terms of its democratic system, uh, the a local commission has no sort of independence. It's uh, at the direct uh, sort of control of the ruling party. And the people who are chosen to lead the commissions have no authority or whatsoever. So it's a classic uh, sort of paradox. Uh, same thing you can actually find in, uh, it was also in Malaysia, you know, just notionally it's independent, but uh, in every sense it has to go by what the government in power says. Uh, similar also story you can find in Myanmar and many other this thing. And then uh, <clears throat> another important thing which sir you flagged about the uh, armed forces, uh, which I also wanted to say. This is also one unique reason where you have uh, in most of the countries, armed forces have upper hand. On, on, on in their, uh, Thailand is best case, Myanmar, you know, which uh, literally army has a sort of veto power on anything. So I am saying, if you look at uh, very closely this, uh, this regions, uh, and there are also good example also like Indonesia, where army also willingly took a sort of back seat and it said it will not get into any kind of uh, sort of political uh, this thing. So, so you have also good examples. But I am saying this is also a region where armed forces have a very, very critical role and they continue to, you know, dominate the political field. Uh, the democratic uh, transition in this, you know, region, in fact, was shaped by US and Europe to a great extent through their, you know, liberal intervention and putting up a lot of institutions, capacity building. In the 90s, there was so much of, you know, of investment were happening in terms of democratization in these regions. Now that has almost disappeared if you look at the last four, five years, because America is, itself is withdrawing. Today you have a situation where US aids, which actually promotes democracy, its uh, grants on democratic promotion has been cut to half by Trump administrations. So there, the, the Europe is itself is in a, on a free fall. So, so, so in a sense, you don't have actually external agencies or you know governments or uh, Western democracy which had strong interest in this region have anything role. Have you heard anything about you know any sort of uh, strong statement from the Western, especially from America on uh, Philippine strongman? Nothing. Thank you. So now it's uh, for me to uh, wind up, and uh, as chairman, since I have the last word, let me say a few things. The role of the military, which I also referred to, and I compared it to Pakistan. I think Vidya didn't agree and said, he, "Where is Pakistan? Where is where are these countries?" But you know, it's a question of you know where do they stand, the military, in terms of guardian of the state. So Pakistani army wants, you know, it's a guardian of the state. That's their thing. So there are similarities in some ways. Obviously, no, no country is the same. And even when you define a region, each country is different. But you have regional characteristics. And there are, I mean, that's how we look at it in terms of. Now, the other point I, I think I'd like to underline here is that liberal values, democracy, these are all interrelated. What is the challenge from Islamist parties and movements to this whole trend? I think this needs to be examined. I mean, you heard of Sharia law and public caning, etc. in Archie. These were, of course, kind of demands.